Every once in a while, I have the incredible opportunity to hunt in a place that is so breathtaking in its physical beauty and historic significance, I almost forget I'm even there to hunt. This is one of those places. Man, if I was a turkey, I'd live right here. About 100 years ago, this stretch of land became the first federally protected wilderness on the planet. And now, I have the great fortune of hunting Miriam's turkeys here with my friend Carl Malcolm, just as countless generations have done before us. A country like this is just too good not to have a bird in it. Welcome to the Gila of southwestern New Mexico. They're here somewhere, and we're gonna find them. I've followed trails of all kinds, pursuing wild game through our country's wildest places. These are my stories. There he's out. These are my people. <laughs> I'm Steven Ranella, and this is Meat Eater. We're right on the edge of a big burn scar. There's these little islands of live trees and lots of open burn country. And you know, obviously the birds like to roost in those live trees, but they actually spend quite a bit of time out in the burns, especially chilly mornings. You know, those gobblers like to strut when that first sun's starting to hit them. Yeah. Now I want to get something clear right up top here. One of the greatest books ever written was A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. That's just the truth. In 1912, as a young hunter, conservationist, and U.S. Forest Service supervisor, Aldo rode horseback through this half million acre stretch of mountainous grassland centered around the headwaters of the Gila River, and he had an epiphany. In order to maintain this ecosystem, he figured the best thing we humans could do was to leave it be and just enjoy it as it is. 12 years later, Leopold would see his radical idea codified into law when this landscape became the first forest service holding in American history to be permanently protected from development. That was 40 years before the 1964 Wilderness Act officially designated this place the Gila Wilderness Area. Let's see, we'll walk the edge of that camp. Let's, let's just jump over there and do a little sound check. So my strategy is basically just to pound a lot of ground and just keep going as I'm going. My buddy Carl Malcolm got his PhD in wildlife ecology and is following in Leopold's steps with a distinguished Forest Service career. A country like this is just too good not to have a bird in it. So I'm feeling pretty optimistic here. He's been hunting turkeys in here for years and has scoured this place from one end to the other. He is an absolute hardcore hunter and angler and cares as much as anyone about the intricate relationships that occur between us humans and our natural world. He's the ideal companion for experiencing this pristine landscape. Dead zone. Keep working back to the next canyon. Call a long way. They're here somewhere. And we're gonna find them. Man, if I was a turkey, I'd live right here. But I wouldn't call back to you. No? No. I'd be like, let's be sliding on out. I'd be an old turkey. We do a bit of a listening tour as we make our way deeper into the wilderness. We're hoping to hear some gobbles, which could impact where we camp and which direction we might hike in the morning. Super turkey looking country, man. Yeah. It's dry though. This is the driest I've seen it. 
this time of year. But the good news is everything we're hunting is gonna be around water. So I do think down in these creek bottoms, we're gonna see some evidence of action. It's remarkable how little splashes of water here and there just change the landscape. Yeah. Like if you get a little spring bubbling, it's just like an epicenter of life. You know, you'll bump into bears, you'll bump into turkeys, you'll bump into elk, you know. And one of the things about the Gila that's so cool, you know, we're very far south to have such an abundance of water on the landscape. Yep. And so, you know, the, the biodiversity here is phenomenal. And you also have a number of rare endemic species, so species that occur only in this place. Yeah, the water up here does seem fragile, man. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we've, we've been talking a little bit about the times I come back here, how variable it is. You know, the last time I was on this stretch of water, it was hard to get across here without soaking through my boots. During right turkey season. Yeah. And now it's one hop to a big rock and you're across. You're right, that fragile word, I think, is an apt way to describe any of these water resources in the southwestern mountains. Here's what's funny. When I asked Carl if he was sure he wanted to film here and potentially draw interest from you folks at home who might decide to one day come to the Gila yourself, Carl said, if they want to go through what I had to go through to find a few pockets of turkeys in here, be my guest. Which is to say, turkeys in backcountry areas like this aren't nearly as abundant as they can be on agricultural landscapes. Here, you're simply not going to encounter flocks of dozens, let alone the hundreds you might see congregated in a picked cornfield during a Midwestern winter. In fact, you're just as likely to spook a family of bears into a tree as you are a family of turkeys. Well, I haven't seen a bear in a tree in a few years. It's like the perfect tree for three bears to be sitting in. I feel like it's a rare trip to the Gila where I don't bump into a bear or three. Not loving our presence. Wait, should we leave them alone? An increased presence of predators here, combined with frequent scarcities of both food and water, keeps turkey numbers relatively low. The birds that are here are here in large measure thanks to the high frequency of wildfires that clear the undergrowth from beneath these ancient stands of ponderosa pines, creating a sort of timbered grassland that has supported turkeys for thousands of years. It's like so manicured. Yeah. That's fire doing its job. Yeah. But it is, it's like hunting turkeys almost in a park. Yeah. But just like totally natural, thinned, but just thinned by. Yeah, thinned by fire. Every, if you look every tree, you'll see evidence of fire scars, cat faces. So this is a frequent fire ecosystem. Oh, it's like really good turkey country. It is. Great listening spot. And yeah, it's beautiful. Cozy camping spot. Yeah, for sure. Camp right here by this pile of bears. <laughs> no shortage of bears. We pitched our camp and, and perhaps the world's most beautiful turkey camp. <laughs> I would, I would not argue gorgeous, with that. man. I do love this spot. But we haven't heard a gobble in like a long ass time. But yeah. we're gonna just take a stroll, see if we can hear like an evening gobble. A lot of times birds, Miriam's especially, like to gobble as they're getting in their roost and then gobble for a while in the roost. Yep. So we can go out right now and find a gobble, we'll know what to do in the morning, but if you don't hear a gobble tonight, it doesn't really tell you what's gonna happen in the morning. Yeah, I would agree with that. If you don't hear a gobble at daybreak, then you're gonna put some miles in. It's time to move, yeah. yeah. So we'll hopefully pick up a little something tonight at dusk and, and get an idea about what's going on out here. At this point in the evening, we aren't gonna chase the birds. They're headed for their roost, and it can be hard to call them in at this time of day. There's a couple, there's at least two, maybe three. 
Rather than risk spooking them, it's much smarter to hang tight and try them in the morning. If it's safe. Daybreak will be the real test. Carl and I split up in the morning. I head toward those gobblers we heard last night, and he goes to check out another nearby area where he's heard birds in the past. So this is just as nice of a turkey as you could ever hope to get. It's like the epitome of a Miriam's, just a beautiful bird. It's got some of the biggest hooks I've seen on a New Mexico turkey. He's got eight or nine inch beard, I would say conservatively. It's an incredible animal from an incredible place. So I'm just gonna get the guts out of this bird and snag the edible bits for later enjoyment. So that'll be the heart, liver, gizzard, and the, uh, the Rocky Mountain turkey oysters, which are always a hit around the family dinner table. Meanwhile, I'm having a slow morning. That gobbler we heard last night, like sounded off like twice is all. He's not making any noise. I'm surprised how quick it happened, but I heard Carl shoot. I thought he had a long ways to go, but he wants to run into something. Eventually, I head back to camp to check in with Carl and figure out what all happened. Got him. That was a good morning. Yeah, well, that was quick, though. Yeah. Right at sunrise. Yeah. Did he just come right off the roost on you? More or less. Really? Yeah. Yeah, man. I think it's like the nicest Miriams I've ever gotten. Yeah. Sweet, man. Yeah. That's great. Worked out well. God, did you hear any other ones? Yeah. A couple others. How about you? Just th that one that we roosted last night. Yeah. Never gobbled in the roost. Really? Gobbled twice on the ground and vanished. Yeah. And I never heard another gobble. That's why I came back here, because the CD wanted to boogie to a new zone. Oh. But I don't know. I'm open to that idea. If I was going to hunt again tonight, I'd go back into that area where he decided to gobble last night at dusk. Yeah. And go back in there and see if I can't get in on him or have him come to me, you know? Yeah. With the evening setting in, I do decide to stick to our area and try for those same birds yet again in hopes that they fire up and make some noise. Carl hangs back to get his bird taken care of. 
That's one of the things I love about a Miriam's turkey in a place like the Gila is that this bird has just the story of consistent occupancy and presence. And, you know, when I'm thinking about what I'm gonna do with this meat, I feel like I'm gonna be feasting on the place via an animal that's been here uninterrupted for a very, very long time. So my goal right now is basically just to get as much meat off the turkey carcass as I can. I'm a big fan of plucking birds, but in a situation like this, I'm gonna break the bird down, let things kind of air out and cool off, because it's gonna be tomorrow morning that I'm gonna hump this meat back to the trailhead and get it on ice in the cooler. One nice thing about dealing with meat in the southwestern climate is the humidity is so low that even when it's kind of warm outside, if you've got good airflow and you keep things in the shade, it's amazing how fast the evaporative cooling can help take off that body heat. This is the vicinity where that bird was first hit the ground, I think. Just wait him out, try to call. I give it a couple of hours, but I get no indication that the birds are still around, much less wanting to play ball. No, you can get them in the evening, but now like the sun's setting, it's just so hard to call them in. They want to go to their roostry, you know, it's hard to pull them away from their plan. So I'd rather not spook them and, and work them in the morning, but hopefully in the next half hour here, find a couple more that are in this area. Finally, the next morning, something shifts and one of those gobblers is on fire. spring and like all winter thinking about turkey hunting like that's what you're thinking of is to have that long of an interaction with a bird oh what a beauty oh that was great man you know i've hunted turkeys in a lot of places a lot of states a lot of different conditions and you know what farmland turkey hunting i'm not gonna knock it it is the funnest thing in the world when you just got like pow birds gobbling everywhere. But these wilderness birds are just few and far between. And when you get a gobble, you gotta take it like real serious. Cause there's, you know, as like happened yesterday, there's not necessarily another gobbler around the corner. What do you think, man? Yes. Steve, that is awesome, man. What a difference a day makes. From the minute I got up there, and I'm like, he's like, Pow. dude. Pow. I mean, he must have gobbled a hundred times. That's awesome, dude. Congratulations. That's a yeah, that was great. Beautiful bird. Those are like two Miriams that are as nice as they ever could be. Mm -hmm. You earn them with your legs in here, man. You get back in and you can have a great hunt. Did you hear any birds? So right at first light, we heard a couple of very distant gobbles, 
and they actually led us in the direction that we were talking about heading this afternoon. Mm -hmm. We were within nine tenths of a mile of where we're talking about camping. No. Yeah. I'm gonna chalk it up as a success for the both of us. Mm -hmm. I used to do a lot more Thanksgiving style whole ones. Yeah. I do much fewer of those now. I just get a lot more meals out of them now, you know? Use each part for what it's best for. Turkey breast doesn't last long in our freezer because even when I'm out of town, people are digging through the freezer. They're like, oh, that looks easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With the rising heat, Carl decides to hike back to the truck to get our meat on ice while I forge ahead to our next camping spot. A primary aspect of designated wilderness is like, obviously you can't ever build roads in it, you can't log it, you can't mine it. And going through these timber stands, it sort of demonstrates the restraint required to have wilderness because you got these like perfectly spaced out giant ponderosas. I mean like valuable, valuable timber logs. And you can just imagine, you got a lot of people who'd be waiting in line to come in here and cut it and sell it, right? And that's kind of part of what pisses people off about wilderness is they'd look and be like, what a waste. And not recognize the intrinsic value of it. The next morning, I set out to fill my final tag in an area where I'd put a gobbler to roost the night before. This time, it doesn't take long. We got some heart, we got liver. We don't have any kind of oil or anything anymore. No salt. We're trying to take some prosciutto and see if we can get enough fat out of it to fry some jibs. Turkey Mountain oysters. You know what's funny about these little nuts is they rupture just like a buck nut. Yep. Dry nut. My first ever turkey nut. Cheers. Cheers. Hmm. Tastes like turkey. It, it kind of does. Yeah, tastes like a turkey nut. I think that is worth. You like those? Worth keeping. I'll send you mine in the mail. Yeah, not a fan. No. It's like if you cleaned your turkey and then licked your fingers, <laughs> but had a, a nut. <laughs> You're not selling it. <laughs> That's what I thought it tastes like. You're not selling it. <laughs> I love the heart. I love the heart. If I could shoot a turkey made out of turkey heart, I'd still hunt them. Would you? Oh, I, yeah. I think I'd go for one made Dude. out of breasts and legs. Oh, God. Yeah, I love turkey hearts. They're excellent. Turkey nuts. You could leave them. Mm -hmm. You can do next to liver. Yeah. Uh, 
That's really good. Yeah, the Zergy liver, Zergy livers are great. When you think about the history of the wilderness movement and this place is sort of the genesis of it in many ways with Leopold's work here, it really started with this place. You know, 100 years on now, here we are, busting our butts, wearing blisters on our feet to try to get back in here. And I like to think how those sort of forefathers of wilderness would feel about knowing that 100 years on, there's a couple of dudes sitting here cooking turkey livers yeah. in prosciutto fat <laughs> and having the kind of time that we'll be looking back on when we're old and unable to cover ground the way we can today. Yeah, they would be like, see, I told you, people are gonna like this. Yes. Fun getting to share it with you. Yeah, man, we talked about coming here for, as you know. Years. A long time. Yeah. What you need to start thinking about now is you're gonna field a call someday, and I'm gonna say, hey man, what would you think if I wandered back into them there hills? Yeah. With my kids. Yeah. Not yes, but hell yes. All right. Yeah. You and your kids? I and my kids are along for that fun. We plan that as like yeah. a Malcolm Ranella family adventure. You down? Yeah.